Prince Baylor Targaryen, a.k.a. Baylor Breakspear. A hero, a legend, beloved and accomplished, and all the more memorable because he died well before his time. And that death left a huge hole in the Seven Kingdoms. Though his father was a good king, he was called Daron the Good, after all, the realm looked forward to the day when Baylor would take his place. They weren't you know, eager for Daron to die, but the outlook for the Seven Kingdoms had rarely been so upbeat. The future was very bright. There was a sense of optimism knowing he was next. You have a good king followed by someone else who seems to be able to fill his shoes well. Two kings in a row of good quality, maybe even a good one followed by a great one, was what some people saw coming. Rarely have we seen such a thing, if ever. It was needed following the terrible rule of Baylor's grandfather, Aegon the Unworthy, and the strangeness of his own namesake, Baylor the Blessed's time not long before. Not to mention Baylor the Blessed's older brother, Daron I, the young dragon who had led the realm into failed wars with Dorne. Baylor Breakspear, on the other hand, had gained a reputation in the first Blackfyre Rebellion as a defender of the realm, as a victor over rebels, as a man who helped turn the realm to peace, rather casting it into war. By the way, it's awfully confusing that we have Daron, Baylor, then Daron, and then Baylor. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yikes! I had to check my notes several times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's no wonder these characters always have their nicknames included, <laughs> because otherwise you wouldn't know which one they are. But the era Baylor was born into is one we've said many times. It falls amongst the most interesting created by George for Westeros with the dance already on TV, along with the Song of Ice and Fires, those versions. It's arguably the most well-developed era that isn't yet on TV. I say yet because, well, at least some of it will be on TV through the Night of the Seven Kingdoms adaptation. So we will see Baylor on screen. Of course, that will only be a small snippet at the end of his life, and he deserves more. So today we will cover his early life. Think of how beloved he was, how terrible his loss was throughout the realm, how deeply that was felt, and realize to have that reputation for that loss to have been felt so greatly, he must have been quite a guy to have all that regard in the first place. But not everyone loved him. Though he was a great warrior, he favored peace like his namesake. But peace isn't always popular in martial Westeros society, and some people don't like too much perfection that can engender jealousy or envy well i guess jealousy and envy are pretty similar <laughs> others just misliked how dornish he looked though so popular but also hated a perfect prince but also one who faced racial animosity charismatic but also someone who maybe engendered jealousy here and there other people wanted to be like him other people wanted him to die so you know a lot of dichotomies here and we'll explore all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Hello and welcome, everybody. Back with another fun historical character study today. You excited for this one, Sean? You got a beverage ready for you? Look at that brand. You get the Branzig shirt on. Last week you said you forgot to wear it. This week, here we go. Yeah, trying to make up for it. It was more fitting for the, the Ned Stark Ned Stark youth episode, I think. But I, I don't think I've worn it on stream yet, so here we go. That's right, yeah. And... I am excited. I do have a beverage here. I found a bang. I found a blue Raz bang <laughs> Raz at the grocery bang. store. Yeah. So I snagged it up, mixed it with the raspberry sparkling ice and the protein naked drink. So you could say you're Raz today, huh? <laughs> is that correct? It's a purplish drink, which I think is fitting for Targaryens. It's like the it's like their eye color. You know, there's a variety of purples that come in their eyes, and I'm not sure what purple that is, but it's more of a medium purple. It's more about a pale purple. Yeah, so I didn't want to interrupt your your intro, Aziz, but I, I had a couple thoughts, a couple japes or whatever. Place to the start. Course of it. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, you said uh, that his death left a huge hole in the Seven Kingdoms. Also left a huge hole in his head. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, God, oh God! True. 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 A little yes. more sentimental, though. I want to point out that the feeling of loss that you point out that the kingdom had. You know that the sort of like optimism that people had for what a great person and leader and everything that he was and how terrible a loss that was to the individual people close to him and to the realm as a whole, but also to the reader. When you read that scene, it's so devastating. It, it, it was to me, yeah. I imagine most people were really one of the saddest moments in the whole story. So I, I, I think it, that's worth noting too. I don't know if that's like a, a first level or a meta level, but uh, 
but a level I think that's worth considering. I agree. I mean, that's why I thought, really care. thought it was worth mentioning right away, even though we're not going to get to that part of his life in episode one, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's the it's spoiler alert. It's the right way to start because, you know, his tragic death is, is, is you're right. That is part of why he's so remembered and it, it, the way George wrote it is particularly memorable and hits hard. So, yeah, that's it's part of why I think he's a he's a big part of why he's a compelling figure. The way he died just it's kind of permanently sets it in stone like that. Uh, so, yeah, everybody, welcome. We're, as I just said, this is a two-part episode. We're going to take plenty of time describing him. The early life is very full. We're going to get to up about the point where he earns his nickname. So it's a pretty apt place to stop, I think. It sets up the Blackfire Rebellions later. Good th- uh, shout out to our friend, good Queen Alley, uh, dot Tumblr.com is her blog. That's Nina's blog, of course. And we usually shout out the most recent post, but we shouted out the most recent post a few days ago. So I'm going to go back and point to one before that, which is a cool what if question. What if Jamie had discovered some of the ways that Robert had been treating Cersei and his lost his temper and, and killed him? What would have happened? <laughs> would Tywin have been able to protect him from those consequences as he was protected from the consequences of killing Ares, which, you know, the double Kingsley. It's like, look, he's already double Kingsley. He can do that. That's who is. It's his name, right? He can do that. So if anyone could save Jamie from those consequences, it would be Tywin. So that is an interesting question. So you'll have to check out goodqueenalley.tumblr.com for Nina's take on that. This episode was voted on by patrons. Baylor got 39% of the vote. Visenya got 30%. Lyman the Sea Lion, the last king of the High Tower, got 16%, and so did Maria the Yellow Toad. So you want to join a uh, Patreon and get involved in the voting? Well, I highly encourage it. As well, as usual, if the episode ends and you are still feeling like you want to stay in Westeros, you still want to be where you've been here and enjoy further stories, well, we've got you covered with suggestions for topics related to this one. That'll be at the end of the episode, along with the answer to this trivia question, which is George loves alliteration and nicknames. It makes sense. Alliterative nicknames are more memorable. That's true in real life. Sometimes you get a nickname and it doesn't stick because it's just not snappy enough. But some names... If they're fun to say, if they're memorable, well, they stick. Baylor Breakspear is a good example. His namesake, Baylor the Blessed. They have the double B sound. Or Baylor the Blessed's alternate, less flattering nickname, Baylor the Befuddled. Baylor Breakspear didn't have a mocking name that I know of. That just goes to show. It says a little something about him. A currently living A Song of Ice and Fire character is named Baylor, and they also have two nicknames. One is compliment, one is mocking, just like this. What are those nicknames? Mm, Yes, yes. This has been a long time coming. It's always been a bit of a missing piece from our long ago created Blackfire series, which focused on the Blackfires. (laughs) But not entirely. We did one episode on Daron himself, Daron the Good, Baylor's father. So this is probably, almost certainly, the most important character from that time period that we didn't give a dedicated episode to. And now we're going to make up for that lack by doing two episodes on him. And that's fitting because there's that much to say, which further highlights how much he's deserved an episode for a while. And in terms of tone, this episode will feel a bit like the Eamon episode, which was also two parts. A lot of talk about his early life because the time period he grew up in was so interesting. This is... About 34 years later, that's uh, Eamon and Bela were born 34 years apart. We talked in the Eamon episode about how he would have been a inspiration, uh, a, a figure for other boys of martial nature, especially other Targaryens, to be like. And arguably, Baylor is the one who most succeeded in being like the Dragon Knight. I say that with a few caveats because we don't fully know what the Dragon Knight was like in some ways. There's a lot of unknowns there, and the same goes for Baylor. But what we do know is very positive. It's it's something I have to remind myself sometimes that I, I think of this as just being like a completely different time period. You know, this Dunkin' Egg time period, I think is completely different from the Game of Thrones, you know, the main series time period. And, and each of them are completely different from the Dance of Dragon time periods. I think of them as just being completely removed and separated from each other. But there are con- 
contiguous characters. Mm-hmm. It's not that far removed, you know? Yeah, so it's neat. It's, it's, it's a weird to think about that sometimes. Yeah, and of course, this is just like the Eamon episode as well. We don't have Fire and Blood to help us because Fire and Blood covers the period right before that. In fact, as we mentioned at the time, Fire and Blood basically ends with the birth of Aegon and Aemon. So let's get started here. His birth was in 170 during the final year of Baylor the Blessed's reign. Technically, Baylor reigned into 171, but it was literally like a week or two into the year <laughs> that he lived. So basically, 170 was his final year. Technically, 171 was. As firstborn to King Daron, or Prince Daron, later King Daron, he was immediately pretty high in the line of succession. Baylor I was king, his uncle Viserys was next, then Aegon, who became Aegon the Unworthy, then Daron, then baby Baylor. That's a straight line, right? That would only change if Baylor had had kids, but Baylor died really soon after our Baylor was born. By the time Baylor was two, he would have already moved from fifth in line to third in line because Baylor the Blessed died, and then Viserys too ruled less than two years. So things changed pretty quickly. So among other things, he was expected to be a king one day from very early on. Nina says, although I don't know to what extent the succession question was certain at the moment of his birth, King Baylor did have the three sisters. And while the dance hadn't exactly validated that a woman could rule as queen, it wasn't also exactly settled either. Maybe it became settled over time as more and more time passed and more and more women had been passed over. It's arguably still not settled. I mean, these these are Rhaenyra's grandchildren we're talking about here. So it's it's we can't assume that everyone would just been okay. Women don't get to inherit anymore. That's it. Period. Uh, it it probably probably was not the sentiment, even if some people did feel that way. Even if a lot of people felt that way. Nor do we know what Baylor himself had intended for the succession, because he knew he didn't have any sons or daughters. What did he want? It was never known, or maybe it was hidden by Viserys after his death, after Baylor's death. Maybe they kept his his will uh, on the down low. Maybe a little something like what Cersei tried to pull off, but but the, in this case, it would have been more successful in terms of keeping it uh, under wraps. Either way, we don't know um, what Baylor would have wanted and if it would have gone the same way. So it's the point being. We can't be entirely clear on what the succession looked like, but no matter what, Baylor would have looked like a strong candidate, and even more so after Baylor and Viserys were dead. I remember talking about the idea that, um, because it seemed like Ned and Brandon's his brother, mm-hmm. Rickard, were kind of progressive. They were doing some some very non-standard things, yeah. given the tradition of, of the time, the, the Starks especially. But the quote-unquote traditions of the Targaryens in this more modern time are even less established. And there was even the point I think we we're making in that episode was that there have been a lot of other changes recently, just the dragons being gone by itself, yeah. like some precedent that might have been set in some some council a few years ago. You can't really expect that to hold true when the dragons go away. And it's it, all the other changes that have come. Maybe is it a fault that that certainly seems to be how it went. Yeah. But, but I, I, I agree with you at that time. It, it's not uh, an absolute by any means. And, of course, there had also been the gradual shifting within the Targaryen family culturally towards more matters of the faith, partly because of King Baylor and a few others. Daron himself, the father of Baylor, Breakspear, was, was very pious. And joining with Dorn, yep. who don't have this first son birthright thing going on, yep, right? Which so is, another angle of shifting that could happen. Yeah, and the joining with Dorn is a big part of what's going to happen in this episode today, That that whole the way that plays out during this. As well as, on top of that, we have the, the fact that it's not just a cultural shift because the dragons are gone and they're getting more into the into matters of faith. It's also a power thing, as we discussed in the Aemon episode as well. That's they, they leaned more into that. For someone like Aemon, it was more heartfelt. But for some Targaryens, it was just a matter of maintaining power. Like, well, we need to be cozying up to the faith more because we need their, their power, their authority level that we no longer have with the dragons. We need their endorsement more than ever. And that means playing along, being part of the faith, uh, being the champions of the faith, showing that they're at the top of that ladder. And Daron was a big believer in Baylor the Blessed's faith and virtues, so he very likely passed that on to the son he named after Baylor the Blessed, right before Baylor was even dead. So, uh, And recall much later, 
what, at the end of this episode, we're going to get to this moment. Daron's going to say, Baylor, your work is done. Like in front of the crowd, very memorably, when Doran officially joins the kingdom through marriage. So he really sees himself as carrying on Baylor's works. And of course, he's going to impart a lot of that to the son he named after that very king, right? That seems very straightforward. Daron's wife, of course, was a Martell, Mariah Martell. That's important, too. They're bringing Dorn into the realm. This is his wife. And, of course, Baylor is half Dornish. So that's huge, but also part of why people didn't like him. Some people didn't like him because he was Dornish. Now, it was also this peace treaty that King Baylor made in the first place that allowed this prin the Prince of Dorn to make these arrangements in the first place. And then the later second marriage between Daron's sister Daenerys and Maron Martell himself. So this first marriage between Daron and Mariah set up the second one and all these other things in between made that even stronger. Nina writes, it's maybe a little bit of an insult or pushback against Aegon the Unworthy. Daron's naming his son Baylor is choosing the figure that is so much unlike his own father. <laughs> and this is relevant in a lot of ways because Aegon, of course, spends so much of his reign trying to undermine Daron, saying, oh, you're not really my son. You're the son of the Dragon Knight. Trying to under... Which, of course, is very relevant today because trying to cancel Daron's inheritance would be canceling Baylor's as well. Now, no one calls Baylor a bastard because there's no question that Daron and... Mariah were married. That was a huge public marriage. And there's no question about their par the parentage. But if Daron's cut out of the line of succession, then Baylor would be too, e even being trueborn. Now, the event that actually sort of, quote, took King Baylor's life was when Damon Waters was born, a.k.a. Damon Blackfire. Uh, he was, of course, born to Dana the Defiant, who would have been Baylor, King Baylor's wife had he not set her aside. Technically, as I said, he died in 171 because he fasted in response to Damon Waters' birth. And that fast, which was 40 days long, spanned the end of the year into the beginning of the next year. Now, of course, there's debate other whether the fast killed him or whether Viserys actually poisoned him for making crazy decisions about attacking the North and the Iron Islands and things like that. So it was a pretty big deal. And either way, the timing was important. Nina says, I wonder what King Baylor thought of this infant namesake. He didn't have much time to think about it because he was only alive for a few months. Was he glad to see the, his peace plan coming into, into play? Because they needed these marriages and these children to be born in order for this to work. Like if you have a marriage to Dorn and it produces no children, well, it's not going to work nearly as well, right? If you have a Dornish, half Dornish, half Targaryen prince that ascends to the throne, that is a much better result for this plan than just a marriage that produces no children. And then maybe you're back to square one because no longer a marriage, the marriage is no longer like holding things together. If you have children and a family, well, that's a big deal to hold the peace. So he probably thought pretty well of that, but then immediately became disappointed or sad or whatever the emotion was that led him to fast for 40 days and then die. <laughs> I can't really put myself in that headspace so <laughs> I was like, ah, your, your guess is as good as mine y'all whatever he thought at the beginning of that fast would not have necessarily been the same or rational after 20 days you know yeah that's true regardless this is quite a setup you have Baylor, an infant basically or very young when his namesake died so he never really knew him but certainly lived in his shadow and damon blackfire who i you know joke about as being the killer of Baylor the blessed killing baby killing kings as a baby from the cradle he's uh born only if, like a couple months after these two were just constantly compared throughout their life and this is part of why they're born at the same time basically into the same era at the same court with a lot of the same influences around them and yeah, and it just goes from there. So what a great start. What an interesting start. And he's the, they're the only two that can measure up to each other in terms of like genetic lottery because they both just hit the jackpot with being big and strong and smart and good, really good looking. And of course, Baylor's birth was even better than Damon's, but they both had really high birth. Excellent, near perfect princes born within months of, of each other. 
But with a lot of contrast, despite the high quality, quote unquote, of both of them, uh, they're both physically great, but very, pretty different. Damon actually had the silver hair and purple eyes. Baylor looked more Martell. And yeah, even though they're both princes, I don't know if you, you, you would, they're still pretty far apart in terms of the line of succession and the way they're viewed because of their upbringing. Like one's a bastard, but one's got two Targaryen parents. The same one who's the bastard. And the, on the other hand, the other is higher in the line of succession, but he looks, doesn't look like a Targaryen. And yeah, so there's a lot of just comparable extreme qualities here. It's pretty interesting. You can see why it would get competitive is, or maybe not. <laughs> this is probably too complex of a question. How far apart were they in the line of succession? How far down would it have to go? That would be a lot of t- trueborn Targaryens would have had to die. And since Baylor ended up with a lot of brothers... And then his kid, he had kids, and then his brothers had kids. I mean, his youngest brother was Makar, and that's where Egg and Aemon and another Daron <laughs> and, and, uh, and Arion all came from. Yeah. So, yeah. It, even before that, I don't know if it makes it more or less complicated, but like at birth, mm. how far separated was Daemon? Well, Aegon, it's, it's super complicated. It is complicated because Daemon wasn't acknowledged as, as Aegon's at first. Dana the Defiant wouldn't admit who the father yeah. was yeah. until <laughs> much later. So, they wouldn't have seen him in the line of succession like at all necessarily. And that's like he was the only one, literally the only male of Targaryen blood left potentially. Even then, because even because like a year later, uh, Aegor was born. Now, Aegor is younger than, than Daemon. This is Bittersteel we're talking about. Everybody knew he was a- a- Aegon the Unworthy's son. Even though Daemon was older, Aegor was the one that would have been in the spotlight because he was the oldest acknowledged bastard son of Aegon. And that, and that state of affairs was for several years. So yeah, so it is complicated. <laughs> like maybe, uh, again, still probably complicated, but say at the point that Aegon legitimized the bastards. Yeah. Then he. All the brothers wouldn't have been born yet. Uh, all the sons and brothers wouldn't have been born yet. But even still, it would have been like five deeper, 20 deeper. How, it's you know? tricky, too, because when you legitimize someone, do they just come in line as of where their age is or do they fall to the back of the line or the of the ones who were born targaryen it's on it's that's yeah. unclear too yeah. <laughs> because technically he was still born after balor by by like a couple of months so he would still have been behind balor but if you want to get it down to that level if he was legitimate and the legitimization counted he would be right behind balor until balor had kids of his own right so he right. would have come before balor's younger brothers Ares and Rhaegel and then Makar two of whom did eventually inherit the throne. So, yeah. So maybe more of a claim, not that Robert Baratheon ever tried to make this claim, but he would have had more claim than Robert had as a Targaryen, right? Uh, Maybe, yeah. It's at tricky. that point, at that point. Yeah. Maybe less so. down the road once all the kids and brothers are born, then he has less claim. Yeah, I guess Robert that's true, because Damon, if we're still saying he's legitimized, then yes, he would be ahead of someone like Robert, who's who's got a cousin relationship, distant cousinship. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it does get tricky. You can see why these things often get decided by swords instead of, <laughs> and why they want the succession to be clear. It's like, well, we can't have, we can't even have questions. Mm, yeah. So, and of course, who caused so many questions? Aegon the Unworthy, he made, he, instead of making the line secure, the king himself set it up to be unstable, not just by questioning his own son's parentage, but by bestowing Blackfire on his bastard son, Damon, and setting all that up. But, but we're not to that yet. Having a bunch of bastard sons in the first it, place yeah, also. Right? Yeah, he just like, did it. He just, <laughs> the smorgasbord of things you're not supposed to do as king, he, he did them all. He was really good about doing the the most the worst things possible. <laughs> he's the worst best king, best worst king. You got to be proud of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's the winner. Yeah. <laughs> so, as much as we're making comparisons to Baylor and Damon here, and how easy those comparisons flow, you got to think they were being made in world too. I mean, we talk like people love to gossip. These are the two most famous princes. Maybe not when they were first born, but even the, to the stories of their birth would be worthy of gossip like do you hear the new prince was born and the king starved to death over it and the other one's named after him like whoa you know oh but did you hear his hair is brown you know (laughs) it's like oh you know and the other one we don't know who his dad is they won't admit it's probably Aegon, but we you know could be someone else you know so people are already gossiping about them when they're babies like this is how their life started so these are in terms of comparing the lives of like human beings to other human beings these 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 people are very incomparable because except to each other because there's just very people have lives like this this is like 
having a family is already famous. It's already on TV all the time. And then you have babies on, with strange circumstances with drama surrounding it and death surrounding it. And you're like, yeah, people are going to talk about that a lot. <laughs> so a huge open question, though. And this is something that we just can't possibly know until maybe some screenwriter or George or something, someone decides someday if this ever hits the screen or is, is more stories are written about it. George may write this about this in Fire and Blood, for example. That's perhaps one of the most likely Fire and Blood 2, that is. What did Damon and Baylor think of each other? We know that plenty of people would pit them against each other through gossip and, and through expectations and just through being similar. But what did they actually think? Were they competitive of each other? I ask that now, even though they couldn't have possibly felt that way when they were babies. But since they were already set up this way when they were babies, it was like the world they were born into or maybe almost expected them to be competitive or maybe to expect them to work really well together. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, ultimately, it would come down to them, even though there would be other people, whatever other people say and whatever they gossip about, a lot would come down to how they actually felt about each other and how they behaved in public toward each other, which is not necessarily how they really felt because they were both known to be very chivalrous. So... If they sort of hated one another, they might not have shown it. They might have kept that under wraps, you know, because it's this is an era where you're supposed to, like, behave really well towards your opponents. And chivalry was particularly high on the list of, of how to behave. You know, it's always been imp relatively important in the time of the Targaryens, but more so now because of the increased impetus on piety and following the seven. So that is important setup, even though a lot of it doesn't play out till they're older. Let's talk about what it was actually like the year they were born, the Red Keep, circa 170, 171. Because as impressive as young Baylor and young Damon and eventually Aegor and Brynden, who were born not too long after this, it was Aemon the Dragon Knight who was the one recognized as the finest knight in the realm. He would be the roadmap, the guy to emulate. And this is kind of towards the end of his career because he's going to die youngish too. Aemon died around 43, 44. So yeah, so Aemon would have been uh, about 10 years before that now. So about 34, 33 peak of his prowess before he started to get older and while his legend is still fresh he had been to dorne he had you know he had his fancy helmet he had been given dark sister he had his knighthood from a young age yeah no there's pretty much no doubt this was the guy that they want to emulate especially because baylor's namesake was rescued by him from the pit of vipers i mean that story they would all grow up hearing that one amongst like that's like a top five story they grew up hearing. I could I, I feel confident with that guess because what a great story and it was recent. I mean, mm. let's be honest, that's crazy that story. It's amazing, <laughs> and it's kind of interesting, right? Because Baylor and Damon seem chivalrous, as I say, but Agor Bittersteel, nah, not so much. Not very chivalrous. And neither did Brendan Bloodraven. Not very chivalrous either. Not like a bad guy, but not not a chivalrous guy either. And so that's kind of interesting. Maybe the guys who are a little closer. To the, the legend of Eamon, or maybe just for other reasons, story reasons, random reasons. But it is interesting that the ones who came along a little bit later didn't have this quality while these ones did. Yeah, and they were the ones mo closest to achieving Eamon's both level of fame and skill. And again, the warrior culture aspect was at a high point as well. It wasn't just the piety that was at a high point. It was the proving that they could still rule without dragons. So it was really important for them to showcase their martial abilities like Daron the young dragon tried to do by invading Dorne <laughs> which he brought Aemon along with him smart choice I mean kind of an obvious choice but it made a big difference worth noting that Baylor and Daemon were such good warriors it might overshadow the fact that Brendan and Bittersteel were pretty good warriors too right they yeah, weren't like true. And, and the greatest but uh but they just happened to be competing with the greatest so. and they were like we pointed out with Ned and Brandon doesn't matter like you're a little bit younger and that means everything at that age because one or two years is a big deal when you're that young like the difference between 12 and 10 is huge in terms of your physical development especially when you have two guys who were developing faster than normal <laughs> so they're like yeah <laughs> like agor did develop faster than normal too but those other guys had a two-year head start and they were probably a little better at the finish line anyway and brendan was a little small like he wasn't a big robust guy he was good at fighting but he was more quick than strong now, Viserys II probably had a relatively smooth transition to power because he had been hand, but of course that short period of stability would be so 
was so early in Baylor Breakspear's life that he would hardly know about it, hardly remember it. Nor would he actually remember much of King Viserys II, his great grandfather, because he died when he was about two. Nina wonders whether his mother Mariah Martell would have had opinions on the accession of Viserys II. On on one hand, Viserys becoming king put her husband and now her son on the path of the throne. She was now on track to become queen, which is a good development for the Martells, you would think, and from Dorne's political position. However, to become king, Viserys had to disinherit his nieces, right? Which, as we just said, maybe wasn't a settled way of doing things just yet. And so that rankles if you're from Dorne where women aren't passed over at all. So that's like a big kind of a big deal. She may have been expecting that, but it may not another wrinkle to throw into this whole matter of succession and, and women inheritance is that we have Dornish mixed in here now and they expect women to inherit and they might push for that rule to be reestablished for say, hey, we like it's worked for us really well. Why not have y'all do it here? It also has prevented a lot of civil war because it isn't just about gender equity. It's about avoiding war because the line of succession is a lot clearer when you don't skip people. So there's a lot of possible feelings and attitudes that could have that could be thrown into the the mix to the the blender of of court feelings these days and what attitudes were being espoused by different people. And this is what they, Lauren and Damon, would have grown up in. It's very important to consider because later Daron's proximity to Dorne and Baylor's Dornish blood will be a huge point of fixation for the opposition, the rebel party that forms and eventually becomes the Black Dragons of this era, not to be confused with the Black Dragons of the dance era. They don't have anything in common other than that color <laughs> and the fact that they were competing for the Iron Throne. That's a pretty big deal. So much of this early upbringing came during the reign of his grandfather uh, and the princess in the, in the Maiden Vault would have been freed upon the death of Baylor too. So those three would also have been around during Baylor's upbringing, and those are his aunts. So they would, you know, talk to him, help be part of the village that raised the child sort of thing. They might have liked him because he's this, you know, next in line or, or eventually in line. And who knows what they thought of him? There's three very different women here. Dana the Defiant may not have liked him because she's the mother of Damon Blackfire and looks at him as someone that took her place in the line of succession. But... And her sisters might have felt similarly. On the other hand, Reyna was very pious and may have favored the, the pious faction of Targaryens rather than her side of things. But it, we're, these are pure guesses and probably didn't have a huge impact on Baylor uh, altogether. But just worth mentioning for sure. A couple of thoughts here. Um... In the same way, you were wondering earlier about, or maybe we're constantly worrying, wondering about what relationship uh, Baylor and Damon had with each other. You know, yeah. uh, it's also interesting to think about how these women or other characters, you know, maybe we're talking about these women at this moment. You know, being freed, how how do they feel, and how would they communicate that to Baylor and other people? Like they were just put in jail pr pretty much just because they were women, right? Yeah. But the person who did that to them was on some level trying to do the right thing and starved himself to death doing so. So do they come out of that like angry? Do they want vengeance? Do they find understanding? Do they think they got vengeance? Do they yeah. forgive him? Do they preach forgiveness? Do they, it's weird to think the types of different reactions and, and, and uh, lessons that someone might learn from that and how Baylor might, might take it. And I feel like as a default, He's a forgiving guy. He's a merciful guy. He's not looking for vengeance. He's not looking, you know, it, uh, I wonder if they felt similarly and that rubbed off on him. Maybe other people too. Not sure. Yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah, you, you, it's it's hard to say. You're right. Like with such a wide variety of personalities and such a double-sided uh, scenario where you're right. Baylor, the blessed, he was clearly believed in what he was doing. Even though they they wouldn't couldn't they couldn't have liked being locked up too much. Although maybe Reyna wasn't so so mad about it. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is they probably all had slightly different reactions. That some right. of them might have been depressed about having gone through that, and some might have been angry. And yeah, Reyna might have been like, oh, it was for, it was for the best. It was right. It was the, it was it was, the, it was for the realm. Yeah, yeah like you know, she, like they yeah. all might have had a very different reactions. But and Elena is the one we haven't even barely mentioned. She's the one who had the longest life and sounds like the most interesting of them. She had so many different jobs and she was highly intelligent. Uh, she's someone that would have been around. She, I mean, she outlived Baylor Breakspear. 
Of course, she outlived Balin Blessed. All of these guys did. But she, someone will have to reconsider in part two because she would have been an adult and kind of a power behind the throne, running running Master of Coin through her. Like her husband was Master of Coin, but she was the one who had the skills. It was one of those like he's the cover story or she's the one who's actually doing the job. <laughs> so Baylor, the Breakspear was hand to the king in that, in, in, you know, up until he died. So very likely he was aware of Elena's competence and they would have had a lot of doings together, you know, as family members and all, but it's, it's entirely unclear what those dealings were. Anyway, let's talk about Aegon the Unworthy. He was named for Baylor the Blessed. Aegon the Fourth was his grandfather. So that's not the best thing <laughs> to have this guy as your grandfather. He had a good father, Darren the Good, but a bad grandfather. Aegon ruled from 172 to 184, which would be for Baylor and Damon Blackfire, their age 2 to 14 range. So uh, a huge number of important characters were born in this decade following Baylor and Damon. It's like they kicked off the wave of really important births in the year in this decade of 170 to 179 the same year as agor was born which is 172 baylor's aunt daenerys was born yeah kind of weird to have your aunt be younger than you not that weird for the targaryens nowhere near the most unusual family relationship he'd have too because i mean his grandfather just kept having children you know with bastard children so yeah. <laughs> so Agor, Brendan, and Damon Blackfire, those are his uncles, technically. Not like they're more like brothers, but in terms of actual family structure, they were his uncles. <laughs> so he was also older than all his uncles <laughs> and his one aunt there. Yeah. Very strange. <laughs> and Baylor's brothers were born over the next seven years as well. We don't know exactly when, but in a fairly short period, because seven years is pretty narrow for three births, you know, Ares, Rhaegal, and Makar, right? And in 175, so kind of in between that seven-year period, I guess, was when Brendan Bloodraven was born. So a huge number of important characters, huge number of interesting characters, all within a short period of time. At some point, you become aware of this. Baylor is a young man. He's a well, young boy, a toddler. At some point, he's going to become aware of the fact that his father and grandfather are constantly fighting. And at some point, he's going to learn and understand what it is they're fighting about. Right. He's not gonna be able to perceive that as like a three year old. Like, what are they? Why are dad and granddad always arguing? Like, He's not under he's not able to get it yet. Right. But by maybe age four, five, six, seven, he's going to understand on some level what's happening. And you got to figure that other kids his age would be able to perceive it around the time he is. Damon Blackfire again being one of them, although he's still Damon Waters at that point. So you have. Aegon, of course, constantly trying to undermine Daron and Daron trying to curb his father, the king's worst behaviors, especially towards Queen Neris, Daron's mother, which would be Baylor's grandmother. So while his grandfather was a crappy guy, his grandmother was excellent, very pious, very sweet, very gentle. So someone he may have felt protective over. So you could see Pretty easily, especially given how his personality comes out. If he took sides at all as a young boy, it would take it would be to take his father and grandmother's side. Especially with Aemon the Dragon Knight, the heroic man, also taking his grandmother's side. It's pretty easy to see who the bad guy is, even from a young boy's perspective. I wonder if he remembers Missy Blackwood, Melissa Blackwood, leaving around age seven or eight for him. That would have been when that happens. She was very popular and well-loved at court. So her departure might have been cause for you know him to i don't suppose he'd cry over it but he might feel sad to lose her um even even nary liked her he would be able to perceive that so she was very popular at court and of course it would be very hard for him not to have remembered the ensuing incident with the next mistress of egg on the fourth which was the terence toyne bethany bracken double or triple execution and torture scenario still Aegon throughout this this decade off and on tried to disown daron now that's the thing that would really as Baylor as a kid he might almost be a little confused he's like wait they're trying to argue that uh, that dad that you're the son of the dragon knight isn't that good <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like well actually son that means I would make me a bastard and mean that I'm no longer in the line of succession to be king. So it's not good in that sense. He's like, 
might be a little torn as a seven year old trying to grasp that like but but he's the dragon knight like you want to be his son right like isn't that <laughs> isn't that even better like <laughs> it's like well son i see where you're coming from however you know the seven look very unkindly on un- uh, it's another tough difficult conversation to have about children born out of wedlock and using his grandfather as an example look at all the harm look at all the problems our grandfather and this is before the legitimizations before the problems got really serious like this was more like an ongoing nuisance whereas later it was like a legitimate <laughs> threat to the safety of the kingdom so yeah so a lot of things that had to be explained to Baylor, <laughs> a lot of things that you normal six and seven year olds aren't having to learn about so yet another example of how his upbringing was really the type that would make you grow up quickly you know it was privileged for sure but also very like big on responsibility and, and adult scenarios and may also have motivated him to be a all-around good person he might have realized like i have a lot of challenges out in front of me mm. you know even these other great powerful you know people whether their positions or their their ability as a knight or whatever they're struggling i've i've got to be at least as good as them you know like there's gonna be some time when especially with some of the things he's witnessing he thinks are wrong and maybe feels like someone should have stopped it like that that's like maybe the fault of uh the Dragonite, Amon, yeah. the Dragonite, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That sometimes just he maybe chose the wrong loyalty or whatever, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That if we're going to fault him, that's what it would be. Baylor might have witnessed that and might have realized, like, if I want to step up and stop the thing that I think is wrong, I can't be a skinny little boy. Mm-hmm. I've got to be a big, strong knight. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I can't have any character flaws for someone to attack. I need to be fully righteous. He, I, I think he might have realized that I need to hit every base if i'm gonna fulfill the position that's in front of me i like that i like that idea a lot sean that's really good yeah and it, it fits as well because maybe more so than a lot of courts the the good guys and the bad guys would be clearer yeah some people it's not so clear with but like when you compare Aegon the unworthy to his own father and his own grandmother it's pretty clear who the good guys are in this situation right even for a young boy so he would emulate their behaviors and look at whatever egg on the unworthy is doing as bad behavior even if it's even some of it's just stuff he did. And so he associates that as bad behavior. The the big things like sleeping around and ex- drinking a lot, those would be the things that Baylor would be most keyed in on. Those are the negatives. And yeah, in some level, in some ways, that sounds literally straightforward. But we're talking about a child and what they're learning as a child. And, and it's not so obvious. It's not so clear when you're when you're that young. And also things that maybe are not as like... Maybe sleeping around isn't inherently bad, but it's bad for a king. You know? Yeah. But being vindictive like Aegon was, that's something that universally anyone in any position shouldn't be that way. But when the king is that way, what do you do about that? You, you, If you're going to do something about it, you really have to be a strong person all around. That's a and great that, point, Sean, because one thing Baylor was known for was his mercy. He was known to be lenient towards his enemies or some wouldn't some wouldn't call it lenient, but some like hardliners would call it lenient. But he was known to like think of forgiveness first and peace first, which is very similar to his namesake and his father who followed in his namesake's uh, footsteps. So yeah, so that's a really, that's a great point, Sean, because that is super uh, important to his development and is is how he came out. So it's likely that this is when he learned all that when he was young, when he was most uh, influenceable, when he was just a young boy. Yeah, and his mother's reactions would be really interesting, too, when Aegon's undermining of this part of his family, his main family, got to the point where he tried to invade Dorne. That's his in-law's country. Like, what a strange thing to have your grandfather start a war against half of your own family, right? (laughs) Like, he just launches an invasion. It's like, that's my grandfather down there. You're invading my granddad. Like, granddad, why are you invading my other granddad? <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Of course, it was a disaster of an invasion, which that wasn't great for the soldiers who were sent down there, but it was great for keeping the peace in the long term. And yeah, like, how strange. Nina writes, especially because part of his antagonism was expressed in Aegon's attempted campaigns against Dorne, while Aegon likely incorrectly saw that explicitly disinheriting Daron would provoke a declaration of war from the Prince of Dorne. He probably also decided that marching against Dorne would be a neat way of doing an end around on that. Like, well, if you're going to bring Dorne against me, well, I'll just take Dorne out first and then maybe I can disinherit you later. That may have been his longer term plan. Although 
it might be too much to think that Aegon the Unworthy had long-term plans. He may have more like been reactive and not think that thought that far ahead. There certainly are examples of that that we can point to. But either way, he was shooting himself in the foot. It didn't work. Whatever his plans were, it backfired horribly. And it certainly would have consequences later. It would be remembered by the Dornish. But they would still ultimately rise for the Red Dragons. And Baylor Breakspear was part of why. So he clearly managed this situation well later, uh, despite the damage his grandfather tried to do to it. Now, of course... His own, his own father, the King Daron, probably did even more to reestablish this peace. He's the one that, that really settled it and made the final moves. But Baylor would have been right with him there all the way. He would have been at his side uh, when these things were done. Baylor was a bit older. So we'll get to that as we're going along here. And this too. Like, how would all this impact the talk between him and Damon? Because Aeg Aegon the Unworthy was threatening to name one of his bastard sons king. Uh, he never did it but to put him ahead of the line of succession ahead of Daron by eliminating Daron instead. So what is young Damon Blackfire, Damon Waters and Agor and, and Baylor? They're all like maybe hanging out at court together at this point. Maybe Agor had been sent home by this point. Uh, he would have been back later, but how would this perceive the discourse around them? Like, Oh, you might get disinherited, you know, cause your father isn't maybe really who he says he is. He might be the son of the dragon knight. There would have been weird, this is weird stuff for six and seven year olds to be, to have thrown at them. Like already Damon's being taught that he's a bastard. So he has to, you know, live with that and learn to live with that. And Baylor has to learn what that means too. And they have to learn about these differences that set up between them. When they're when they're three and four, they I, I figure there's a decent chance they got along unless their parents were already like telling them to not like each other or something. Like, oh, you don't want to like him. You know, don't be like him. Uh, but as the world took shape around them and they realized the very different places they were in terms of the line of succession and cultural beliefs and those differences would have gotten larger. And again, the dra the personal proximity and legend of the dragon knight comes up big because remember one of the ways this culminated one of the culminations climaxes of the Aegon trying to disinherit daron was the formal accusation that he made that was settled by trial by combat sorry the formal accusation made by his cat's paw sir morgul hastwick that he never admitted was his cat's paw but we're pretty much all 99 percent sure that is <laughs> that was totally through Aegon. Who stepped up to beat Morgul Hastwick? It was Aemon the Dragon Knight. So from Baylor's perspective, young Baylor's perspective, Aemon the Dragon Knight won the duel that proved his line of the family was legit. So that he saved his family's branch from being disinherited. That's a, he was already a heroic figure, like the biggest heroic figure. And then it became even more personal when his heroic legend was used <laughs> to save his inheritance and his his father from being declared a bastard and his grandmother from being declared, uh, you know, a cuckold or her had cuckolded the king. These would have been terrible had Morgil defeated Aemon or had won whoever he against someone else if, if Aemon hadn't stepped up and it had been someone else. So and, and people would make sure that he was aware of the gravity of that result. And Baylor would know quite well. He probably even witnessed the duel. Um, he may have been old enough. It's. People are seeing executions when they're seven in this world. So duels of this import when you're on a track to be crown prince anyway. Yeah, you're probably getting exposed to this at an early age, especially when your own fate is hanging in the balance. What a thing to see at age seven. Your own future depends on this duel. <laughs> wow. Don't know how to process that. You know, a, a couple of thoughts about that, by the way. Sometimes it's hard for us to, uh, to put ourselves in the shoes of, of this type of trial by combat, you know, this belief that God is, or a God or whatever is, is causing or deciding the result based on this. But that, I mean, it, I mean, it, I, I suppose in modern times, there's still people that have that same sort of sure. devoutness or whatever. And, but for a large portion of history, for a large portion of the world, it really was a genuine belief. You know, I'm sure here and there, there was some like, some cynical people taking advantage of the system, just trying to manipulate the crowds or whatever, but the crowds really believed it. You know, they really yeah. believed that God said this thing, that this was a sign, et cetera, et cetera. And it, especially a six or seven year old boy growing up being taught this stuff. 
course he's going to truly believe it, you know? You're right. He's not going to um, see it as like, he's not going to have the cynicism that older people have. Like, yeah, maybe the gods aren't really, this is something we talk about, it's something we say. No, you're right. The seven-year-old yeah. who's raised, like he's Baylor's namesake. Yeah. His father was pious. You're right. Like he would have really taken the result to heart. I mean, like, oh, this really proved it, you know? My other thought is, once again, we've sort of wondered about the realities, the day-to-day lives and interactions of these different characters. One model we have for this is House of the Dragon, mm. seeing how Amond and uh, and uh, Jace and Luke and all you know all those interactions and and even the the, the idea like if if it ever had happened that uh, if Harwin had ever had a fight with the, you know yeah. if someone had pounded someone trial by combat like how they would have witnessed that how that would have played out depending on who won or lost you know uh, yeah it, maybe not perfect parallels but a good model how it might have been you know. Yeah. If, like two households growing could... within one, like two exactly. Like, yeah. but they're relatives, but they're separate branches of the same royal family, have similar there might ages, be... and there's lots of them. Yeah, <laughs> there might be some phases or some couples that get along well or understand yeah. or aren't ambitious, but there are some who are going to be vindictive or angling or. Uh, snide or and there's, violent or whatever else. There's this know? sort of same like arguing over what is bastard status really like trying to change what it means or ignore that it's real in the case of the dance of the yeah. dragon so yeah, yeah. But it's like yeah but damon's a different bastard yeah but jace is a different sort mm-hmm. of bastard yeah it's like no he's not yeah. a bastard at all yeah he is but he's a different yeah so it's it's kind of like that by the way that's a comparison here too that that should be made is jace's look he doesn't look targaryen right mm-hmm. same as baylor doesn't look targaryen. that would have been a factor for baylor yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's something we can make a, a loose comparison on and speaking of them being used and all that, and rather than witnessing fights, they also start early, especially in this setting, especially given their weight of responsibility and what, what's expected of them in their future. So, yeah, a lot of boys start training with sword and shield and getting used to the weight of armor as soon as they can. As soon as you're able to put that on, as soon as you can lift that sword and shield, you're pretty much doing it. It isn't age so much as just when your body can physically do it. You might be three, you might be six, I don't know, but. We're pretty sure that Westerosi martial culture puts them at it as soon as possible. So Baylor, Baylor and Damon were likely very early starters because they both seem to be physically gifted. They both seem to grow up quickly. And I mean, Damon wound up being literally the earliest knighted in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, so when there was training between the two of them in terms of swords, Damon probably won more than he lost versus Baylor. But Baylor probably exceeded him in other areas. Horsemanship is a strong contender for being something that Baylor was better at. Um, Baylor will defeat Damon in the finals of the tourney that we're going to talk about very famously at the end of this episode. There's also clues that he's better in other ways, like in planning. For, consider what he does in the Hedge Knight, where he's like, let's use tourney lances because they're longer. And they're like, ooh, but that's dangerous because his lances aren't as good. He's like, yeah, but but we're good enough to pull this off. Like, you need to be skilled for that move to work. Otherwise, you're it's going to backfire horribly and you've got like weak lances against real lances. <laughs> so if you don't do it just right, then you've screwed yourself. Uh, and we know of other times that Baylor has won tournaments. So he's clearly not just a winner a, a couple times here. Like it's, There's that whole scene where Dunk refers to Arlen breaking seven lances against him and, and Baylor's like... Actually, it was only four. four, but don't think any yeah. like, you know, the tail grows until he's again showing four his mag- still a lot. Yeah, yeah. he's mag- <laughs> he's still magnanimous about it. And that's that's something we should keep in mind that Baylor, he's always doing that sort of thing. He's always like trying to be humble. And it's kind of hard to because he's just so great. It's like one of these guys. It's like, yeah, you're not. You're trying to be humble. And I appreciate that. But you're great. <laughs> yeah. Your greatness <laughs> exudes from you wherever you walk, like your charisma, your uh, your ability, your high birth. Like, yeah. We appreciate the humbleness, but there's you're not actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Fireball, the Red Keep Master at Arms, who su- was said to have trained all the great bastards. Would he have trained Baylor as well? I think so, at least in part, because he was the Red Keep's Master at Arms, not the great bastards Master at Arms. He, his position was Red Keep Master at Arms. Yeah. But... Baylor would have spent a lot of time on Dragonstone because his father was Prince of Dragonstone. But it, we don't have to assume that just because you're Prince of Dragonstone that you spend a lot of time there. That's the trick here. How much time did Daron spend at court trying to 
stop his father from doing crappy things. We, we I feel like it was a lot. I feel like Daron stayed at court quite a bit because of this and because of other reasons. But it's possible there were long periods of time where they were just on Dragonstone, kind of out of it. I can also imagine, especially if you've got these young, growing, boisterous, excited princes, if they like, hey, Fireball, come to Dragonstone with us. Hey, we want to train on Dragon. Hey, so-and-so's in Dragonstone. Let's go visit him. He would probably not have much choice about it, right? Yeah, like, that's true. Yeah, it may have been kind of more. He might even be excited to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to Dragonstone. I'll train you guys. Yeah. It's, it's, you're right. We should look at it as like a fluid situation. Just again, bringing up the blacks and greens of the dance era. Like they were there a lot. They were there. They were back at Dragonstone a lot. There was some back and forth. Uh, now, there was more reason for those two groups to be separate because the sun started fighting so much. They had to be sort of for, for reasons of potential violence they needed to be separated we do not have that indication here that there's need they needed to be separated so that adds to the possibility that they spent more time together in fact you would want them to spend time together if they're not fighting each other if they're not violent towards each other because they're all gonna they're all of similar rank and you don't want there to be animosity between them and if they're hanging out and otherwise not hating each other then that's probably good you know as long as no news is bad news or no news is good news in that sort of scenario <laughs> Now, in terms of Baylor's brothers, Makar would have been eventually part of this group as well, uh, even though he was a bit younger, but probably not the two middle brothers, Ares and Rhaegal, because those two were not martial at all. Ares was bookish. Rhaegal, well, we just don't know much about Rhaegal. He's the real unknown of this four, group of four here, for sure. I suspect Ares did come to the Red Keep sometimes, though, because of the library there. He was bookish, and the Red Keep had a great library, so he would want to... He would have plenty of incentive to be there, but uh, he wouldn't be paying attention to m much else. Uh, Nina adds, worth noting in the Mystery Night, Egg says, Fireball taught my father and my uncles how to fight. The Great Bastards, too. So that does pretty much confirm that he may not have trained them their whole lives, but he, he started them off, right? If Baylor left later for more time at Dragonstone, then that would apply as well. But that uh, clearly, he Fireball was there early on. Now... Again, because Bittersteel's mom was sent away, he was proud. He was sent away too. We're later told that Aegon the Unworthy at, one, at least one point visited Aegor at Stonehenge, which means he was at Stonehenge, not at court. But clearly, Aegor came back to court at some point because, again, Fireball taught his <laughs> the great bastards how to fight, so Bittersteel had to have been there for part of that. Plus, eventually, Aegor is po constantly pouring bitterness and poison into Damon's ear which he had to do in person like I don't think he's just constantly sending him letters is he that doesn't doesn't sound very convincing like it's that good of a writer that he's just that convincing with his words I don't know it's, it's, it's pouring poison in his ear sounds like they were in proximity to each other and the final piece of evidence for that is that Daron was said to have kept the great bastards close so he kept that sound implies that they were at court where he could keep an eye on them not back at their respective home castles. So even if Aegor wasn't around in Baylor's early years, he was around later where they would have been at court together when they were maybe teenagers. As well, I wonder, Dragon Knight probably got in there with some lessons, some training. They would have loved to get some teaching from him. You might have Aegon not happy with that. The king might have been like, no, you can't do that. He might have been petty about it and made the Dragon Knight stay around him or give him like humiliating duty instead but this might have been beneath his notice such a small thing training the, the young princes at sword fighting it's he might not have cared about that but if Baylor did train with Eamon it might fuel the rumor mongering that he's his grandson <laughs> it's like yeah see yeah, that's like father like grandson that's proof <laughs> so there may have been some like optics reason to not let them be around each other so much Kind of like Harwin in the training yard trying to pretend he's like, yeah. is it the opposite of that? Because Harwin really is father, mm -hmm. where this is like, I'm, I promise that is not my grandson, you know? <laughs> sure, Dragon Knight, sure. It's like, don't you believe me? I'm the pious Dragon Knight. Yeah, but but your, your dishonest brother said otherwise, so. <laughs> 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 I got to believe him. He's the king. <laughs> I have a feeling that not many people really believe that. It, it, some people might have like, <laughs> pretended to believe it for the sake of some political positioning. You know what I mean? But I don't think they really believe I don't think yeah. they really believe it. 
Now, also, to keeping our timeline straight here, Aemon the Dragon Knight died probably when Baylor was only about 10. And so Damon would about the same age. So there's not, there couldn't have been that much training from him in their upbringing. Oh, there could have been a decent bit, but it definitely wasn't happening later in life. And let's talk about that. The death of Aemon is our next bit, uh, subsection here. It would have been a very sad day at court, indeed, that he was a living legend for this generation of royal youth. Uh, and it asks the question, like, who else were they idolizing? You know, there would have been a lot of figures from recent history that they possibly could have idolized or maybe would have looked at as controversial. Prince Damon, right, of Caraxes, most martial figure of recent times other than who had been dead before their time. He had been dead for less than 40 years. So this isn't, this isn't distant memory here. He was very famous, obviously. And, of course, Baylor, technically... Prince Damon, writer of Caraxes, was his great-great-grandfather. So that's, you know, it's a family connection, too. A bit distant, but still there. Now, I could see Baylor looking at Damon as a bit of a cautionary tale, though. Like, he's, because he's not, he didn't emulate him, except maybe in martial skill, but not in terms of decisions, making personality, attitudes, just very different in terms of temperament and all these other things. Like, they're, they're opposites in a lot of ways. So a lot depends on what kind of stories he was told. Maybe this, the stories told about his great-great-grandfather were sanitized a bit, you know? <laughs> and, of course, there's just things that you can't emulate, like being a dragon rider. Uh, Jaehaerys and Aegon the Conqueror seem like more likely idols or figures to emulate. Jaehaerys was so wise and ruled so long and did so many built so many things that were still in use they would have revered him i don't think the the shine would have worn off wouldn't have worn off on him even though we're talking in like a hundred years before and of course the conqueror they're never going to forget him because <laughs> uh, like yeah back to jaharis real quick though like jaharis is the conciliator and there's we were just saying like there's absolutely some conciliator if not a lot of conciliator in the personality of bela breakspeare this is a guy that we just got through saying is all about forgiveness and mercy and trying to like reach accords rather than i mean it's like that old world's most interesting man commercial for for dos equis where they're like he's a lover not a fighter but he's also a fighter so watch yourself <laughs> so that's that's baylor like he he's a peaceful guy <laughs> but he'll throw down and he's good at it so it, it, which is also jaharis like jaharis that was the it was the attitude jaharis had to towards a lot of these lords he would fly to these castles by himself without his protection on Vermithor, a huge dragon. <laughs> so you're like, yeah, look at me. I'm brave, but if you mess, I'm, and I'm coming here in peace, but don't forget about this huge beast behind me. Now, of course, Baylor can't exactly go about it that way. He has to be, there's no dragon backing him, but he's still, he's formidable. And I feel is tactful too. Like he, he doesn't necessarily even have to use those threats. Right, yeah. like it. Maybe it's known that they're there, but I feel like his wisdom and logic are strong enough to solve a lot of stuff without the maybe the threat in the background helps, but without having to go there. Yeah, the, and the respect he carries, and yeah, and the threat is there. Like you say, if you go against him, well, you're going against his popularity, which is substantial, which means a lot of people are going to follow him. So, whatever decisions a popular guy makes, well, you're if you're going against that, you're going against all those people supporting him, and that's that's a lot of weight. Nina had a great take here as well. I really like she suggested not just Damon, writer of Caraxes, but his father, Balon, almost the same name, who was also a hand of the king and heir at the same time, which Balor will eventually be. And he was well regarded both as a warrior and as a statesman. And uh, yeah, and that's only one generation back farther. So that's a that's good. Sadly, they also both died while hand. <laughs> Balon lived only five years longer than Baylor is going to live. Ba Balon died at age 44, and Baylor died at age 39. So, but of all these heroic figures we just named, all these ones that maybe Baylor and some of these other ones could have idolized, the Dragon Knight is the only one that didn't have a dragon, and of course he's the only one that they lived to see his passing. They would go to his funeral, whereas the others they would maybe just see their tombs or the, hear their stories. So, there's, it's undoubtedly more personal and more momentous in terms of a life event. I, you almost figure, like, remember what Rob did when he heard about what happened? He, like, draws his sword and the gods would. He's like, I'm going to get, you know, I'm so mad. And 
Viserys does the same thing with Danny's brother when he's like, I'm going to go kill Robert myself, you know? This just ridiculous, like, drawing their sword. And Roderick Cassell's like, don't draw your sword unless you mean to use it, boy. You know? I almost figure this was a moment like that where, like, Damon or maybe even Baylor himself are, like, drawing their swords. Like, those toins, they killed the dragon knight? Like, oh, we're going to go get them, you know? And then the knights at court are like, all right, chill, 10-year-olds. Come on. <laughs> we appreciate the, the courage here, but you're going to have to let the adults handle this one. <laughs> speaking of john snow has that memory of him and rob yelling out the names of their heroes speaking of like idolizing figures with one of whom was the young was king daron the young dragon right so that would be another one that i didn't mention that one that's one that they might have thought of as a hero so John thinks of how they would do that all the time. And then one day Rob's like, you can't be Lord of Winterfell. You're a bastard. You know, and it's like, oh, the weight of reality just hits him like cold water. Like Rob wasn't trying to be mean. He was just like stating facts like, but you can't be, you know, it's like, yeah, you can't be the young dragon either, Rob. Like these are all, this is all <laughs> fantasy, you know, <laughs> he kind of was the young dragon, but never mind that. <laughs> but uh, so this is what I was saying earlier with these divisions. They would idolize people, but even who they idolize might come up as as a wedge to who they could really be, who they're allowed to be within society. And that's just a really interesting thing to think about, like how no matter how innocent you are, no matter how you're trying to be a kid, this this royal culture is just like telling you what your place is and, and all your friends, too, or who people who might be your friends. You know, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but it's I still think it's the same concept. Imagine growing up a young black girl in America any time before, I don't know, the past 10 years. Like, who were all the idols? Who were all the leaders? Mm. Who were all the presidents? Who were all the center business? It's all white men. Yeah. Right? Like, what do you think as a young child, if you're not a, a white boy, what do you, who are your idols? Who are you allowed to be? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if you try to pretend like you're president, you're going to get scoffed at, you know? That's a good point. Yeah. Let's talk about competition, jealousy, and swords. That's the next section here. This raises the question, uh, questions like this, like jealousy and these divisions and, and how the children would handle it. One example that I think is very visual that, that maybe wouldn't have occurred to y'all that I thought of when, when we were thinking about this episode is that the Kingsguard would be around Baylor a lot because he's in the line of succession. They would be protecting him as one of the crown eventual inheritors of the throne. Damon Blackfire would not have that protected. He would have Kingsguard following him around all the time. He's a bastard, right? And he's not, they're not, they wouldn't be thinking of him in, that, in those terms. They would have respect for him because of his martial prowess and his bearing and his skills, but he wouldn't be someone they need to protect. You know, he's not like a... Uh, an important figure that must be kept alive. So, uh, you know, that kind of thing might rankle. And that's the kind of thing someone like Bittersteel would maybe point to, to be like, look at how he's getting more regard than you. Like the kind of thing that if you're trying to draw drive a wedge, if you're trying to start something, you would point at these little differences and try to make them about your pride and just the devil on one shoulder whispering why you should be upset. Kind of like a lot of modern media, like telling us what we should be mad about, you know, like outrage media like you should be outraged Baylor or Damon rather look at what look at he's getting all these things that you deserve you know yeah very similar to that I think now again so shocking news about Damon's sword <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so again so much hinges on what they actually thought of each other did they get along did the possible wrangling of their own factions you know, work and get them to dislike each other? Or did they kind of rise above that? Do they respect each other? No idea. So, but it's a very compelling question. Somewhere around 181, when they were about 11, Shiera Seastar was born, her mother Serenity died. This is when Aegon had become grossly overweight and diseased. So he wasn't uh, very mobile anymore. Now we're guessing Shiera and Baylor didn't have much to do with each other throughout their lives, but they would have had something to do. Kind of like Elena, she was around court a lot. So was Shiera. I mean, Cher would have been at court while Baylor was hand, and Baylor was hand for 13 years later. So that's a, maybe we'll come back to that in part two if we have some ideas on it. But also around the year 181, maybe 182, that's when Nerys died. So that would, although it could have been as late as 183. So that's his grandmother, and that's also the queen. So this is a pretty big deal because let's not forget 
the quirk of incestuous dynastic marriages. Sometimes you only have one grandmother <laughs> and one grandfather. <laughs> so, yes, this is his one grandmother that passed. So that's kind of like, ooh, uh, yeah. Hmm. And he all- Half the grieving. Yeah. <laughs> That's silver lining of incest. Definitely looking at the bright side, Sean. Yeah. Uh, so he also only had one great grandmother. Yeah. If you go back far enough, you know he's got the Lysine, the Lysine great great grandparents or what have you. Anyway, so Neri's also is one of the few remaining connections to the dance aftermath. Uh, she was born about five years after it ended, so she was one of the few people that lived around dragons that was still there since Aemon died first. One of the few left at this point was Aegon the Unworthy, who outlived his younger brother and sister despite his ill health. In 182 came the famous Squires tournament that Damon won. This is it's when he got his unusually young knighting, which was probably done in part by Aegon because it was scandalous and noteworthy. It's part of why he did it. Maybe also because he might have had a rare moment of of realizing his own life wouldn't last much longer given his health. And he was also just known for ignoring traditions and things like that. He flounted them constantly. W- did Baylor participate in this Squires tournament? No idea. But seems pretty likely. Definitely not a guarantee. He might have been on Dragonstone or something. Maybe his father didn't want him competing against these boys. But that doesn't seem likely because he did later in other tournaments. So I think that's important. Something else to consider, though. The Sword Blackfire was given to Damon as part of his prize for winning this tournament. That was going to be Baylor's sword. It would have passed to him. Did Baylor care? Was he like, hey, that was going to be my sword? Now, Daron didn't, wouldn't have cared. He, I mean, he might have cared in terms of the symbol, but he wasn't going to have used the sword himself, or else he might have already had it. Right? He was the heir, although his father didn't give it to him. But it would have been Baylor's one day, had it not been given to Damon, because he was a warrior, and that's just typically how it's used if you're the king and you're not a martial guy you often give it to your heir the son the heir who is martial and let them wield it and be the family is stronger for it so interesting how old about how old were they at this time 12 12 hmm. both of them would have been 12 yeah 12 seems pretty young to give him that sword yeah and I, I i was also wondering if maybe Baylor would have been Maybe that tournament made him realize he needed to be a better knight. Maybe he was in it and didn't do well and realized he needs to get better, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, hmm. But even if that's the case, it's still tw- how good could Damon have been to get this sort of age 12? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, you hear how Sir Eustace talks about him, but I mean, Eustace is yeah. a little, you know, in love with the past. But still, like, Damon was maybe, yeah, maybe was the best warrior since Aemon the Dragon Knight. Uh, I know that, not that that was that long after Aemon the Dragon Knight, but still. A lot of people put Damon Blackfire in the top five of all time warriors. That's kind of a, I mean, that's really a matter of opinion. There's no way to really know. But yeah. Now, Baylor, again, we talk about him being chivalrous and graceful. So I don't think he would have like, he. I really doubt he like made a scene or anything like that or got publicly upset. But in private, he might have been kind of upset about it. And his father as well might have been upset about it. Well, his father would have definitely been upset about the symbolism of it and what it might mean. In terms of just besides the sword itself, in terms of what his father was doing, like, oh, here my dad goes again with trying to undermine our side of the family. He might be worried about what would come after that. And he would be right to be because two years later came the deathbed proclamation of legitimization of all these these fellows. So, yeah. So there would have been some discussions in private at the very least about how what this might mean. And, and Baylor himself might have been asked away. And he's like, well, father, I don't. I don't want to cause a scene. I don't want to be have this be a problem on my behalf. He's like, oh, okay, well, that's good of you, son. But it's more than that. It is bigger than just the sword, right? It might mean the sword is a symbol of the conqueror. And, you know, we've seen him try to undermine our line before. This might be a prelude to another attempt to throw us out of the line of succession, which it kind of was. It wasn't fully, but it, it kind of was. So, yeah, Baylor would have probably been, if he didn't realize the implied threat to his own place in the line of succession, he would have had it explained to him. And I think he probably did because he was wise beyond his years, most likely given everything he was faced with from young age on. He just was expected to have all these adult responsibilities and uh, he took to it. So uh, I feel like he would have seen this. He would have understand at least some of the significance. Yeah, this was public. Let's not forget, this was a public gift of the sword. It wasn't like in in private, you know, you've earned this sword, kid. You know, here you go. 
No, this was in front of everybody who watched the tournament. Big public courtly thing. Yeah, the whole realm would have heard about it. Like right away, it would have been the subject of gossip, just like their births were, just like some of these other things that happened along the way. The whole the court, the realm, talk of the talk of the week or the next few months or whatever. And then, then beyond that, as it as the situation <laughs> continued to evolve, I definitely feel like it was a I don't know political, optical move or whatever more so than anything. Just like just like time and making Jamie on the hands guard. Maybe they, there's some ostensible reasoning behind it, but that's not really what it was. If that's what it really was, it could have been done in private. It could have been done in a bunch of other ways. But the fact that it was done in public, I think that it was a strategic move. Yeah. Now, Daron, spiteful move, yeah. Daron might have counseled, you know, just let's roll with the punches here. You might have said things like, well, like a non-starcastic Stannis. You could have said, well, let's just pray harder <laughs> about the situation. <laughs> you know, let's not get violent. You know, and Nina also adds a great point. He could have counseled Baylor if Baylor was feeling jilted or like he lost something. He's like, look, man, look, son. Yeah, he got the sword. You're gonna get the kingdom. You know, you're gonna you you have more than him. You're ahead of him. You know, be gracious about it. You know, he he still has less than you. And that might have that might have worked. That argument might have worked. Nina says we also think of the arguments Egg uses in the Sworn Sword when Eustace Osgray explains his allegiance to the Blackfire cause. The Daemon was simply the best swordsman, and the gift of Blackfire was just an expression of that. You're the best swordsman, you get the best sword. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It doesn't mean you you should be king. Although clearly some people did see it that way later. This is in the immediate aftermath of the gift and, and before anyone knew the full consequences of what it would mean. Darren could also remind his son, lots of Targaryen warriors were great without wielding Blackfire. Magor was, giving, was given Blackfire by Aenys, and there was no disinheriting his own children of that now. Magor did usurp Aenys' children, but it wasn't because of the sword. It was because of other factors, and it, was, it wasn't done with the sword either. That was more about Balerion. <laughs> that certainly had more to do with it. And of course, Aemon... Not Aemon the Dragon Knight, but Aemon's son of Jaehaerys and Alysanne, the firstborn son of theirs, who was father of Rhaenys, the queen who never was. He was master of laws and prince of Dragonstone and a great warrior, and he didn't wield either Blackfire or Dark Sister. So, yeah, there's, just, there's some good examples, historical examples Darren could have pointed to. And Baylor probably had, you know, enough of an education to have already known about these figures, so it would just be like a reminder, you know, like, you know. Think of your great, 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 great grandfather and this, who did this and that, and, you know, yeah. And furthermore, Daron, again, using the path of least resistance, using the path of peace, using clever moves, subtle maneuvers rather than violent, you know, public displays, things like that. Daron would devalue the ancestral swords in general by giving Dark Sister to Blood Raven. It sort of further suggested that these weren't that big a deal. So it kind of devalued Blackfire by giving Dark Sister to Blood. It was pretty clever. Now, we don't know when that happened, but it was uh, at some point. <laughs> you know, Blood Raven was only seven at the, during the Squires tournament, so it wasn't that early. But uh, of course, he couldn't have done it when Aegon was still alive, anyway. But so this came at some point later, and Darren would also start giving the. The sooner he does it, though, the sooner it has the effect. Yes, yes, right. Yes. The, the more clear it is to to that it's meant to have that effect, the the quicker it does have that effect. That I I feel he probably did it. I, like so, if he's seven at that tournament and. And uh, Aegon died two years later. I think he gave the sword of Blood Raven when he was like nine or ten years old. That's what I think. Yeah. Now there's also the opposite side reactions. There may maybe Baylor's close relatives would be, you know, having their own reactions to the Blackfire incident. But what about Damon's people? Like, if Dana the Defiant was still alive, she'd be like, "Yeah, he deserves that," you know. And he, she might even be outspoken about it, and that might rankle some feathers even more because it's it's a public discussion about things like this that maybe are better kept private so it's just everyone's gossiping and all that so the whole discourse is a little loud perhaps and it might be it might offend some people she might be saying things like oh he's does he if she says he deserves this and people take that to mean he deserves to be king you know public statements so one of the problems with them is they can be misinterpreted by people you can you can read things that aren't there and in a world like this where most of the information is secondhand anyway. You got people inserting their own biases in these statements, and the game of telephone is all the more toxic. 
So that could have really gotten back to the Red Faction, which wasn't the Red Faction yet, but the people that would eventually become the Red Faction, they might hear all this talk about how, oh, look at them uppity. Well, they wouldn't be the Blackfires yet. They just got the sword. <laughs> but this, this whoever he, they would be referred to in, at, at the stage, they like, oh, then look at them stepping out of line, you know, this, this kind of thing. So, yeah, it's very interesting. Now, maybe... Damon, maybe Damon the Defiant wasn't even alive at this point, so this this might not have even happened. But there would have been some fans of Damon, you know, he would have had his entourage or or whatever, and they would have been all for it. So the the bottom line is still there. A question for another time. I don't think we asked this in the Damon Blackfire episode. Would he have gotten a dragon if they were still around? Is someone does does a bastard, a double Targaryen bastard, get a dragon? Does that like who qualifies for dragons and who doesn't? You know, I think he would have been allowed to claim one probably given how popular he was but i don't know it's interesting could they have stopped him good question too yeah well amen just took one right yeah what if they just say no you can't have one or just banned him from trying but what if he got one anyway would they make him give it up i mean yeah i don't know that would have been an interesting question once he's bonded to him how can they make yeah it? can I mean, you make I, them give it? Yeah, i, I think one way or the other he would have got one that's what yeah I <laughs> Uh, Nina points out Damon tried to give his own mistress a dragon egg. They made him they made him give that back, but still like if if that was even remotely on the table, mm-hmm. then I think Damon Blackfire is Damon, several levels higher in terms of <laughs> like he's at least got the Targaryen blood, like Mazaria did not. <laughs> so uh that's not a question for Baylor. He definitely would have gotten a dragon even though he looks Martell, like yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't matter. So mm-hmm. And would he? Who would he have married too? If he, if he, if it wasn't for the incest marriage, just being kind of out of fashion in this era. Interesting to point out for another discussion for another time. The incest marriages came back pretty quickly after this era, like off and on. But this is the era when they were pretty off. He might have married his aunt Daenerys. That's my best guess. The one that married Meron Martell. But then, who? How would they have united the realm then? So yeah, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but very likely not the person he did marry, which we'll discuss in the second half, because this marriage was very unusual, and we'll also discuss Damon's marriage and a few other things. Our midway point in the episode is here, the year 184. Aegon has passed, the, the king, Aegon the Fourth, the Unworthy, but on his deathbed he made that famous, well, infamous rather, decree legitimizing his bastards, all of them. The man most responsible for taking care of the mess he made, not to mention the other messes the unworthy king made, was of course his son, now King Daron. And the next most important figure is our subject, Baylor, not yet called Baylor Breakspear, but earning that reputation, who is now the crown prince of Dragonstone upon the death of his grandfather. So his responsibilities, his proximity to the throne, all these things are on the upswing. And let's see how he handled it when we come back for the second half here. Shout out to patron Matthew Chase, who correctly predicted in our poll that this would be a two-episode topic. (laughs) You nailed it, Matthew. (laughs) You did indeed. When you said it, I was like, yeah, I commented. I responded to your comment and said, yeah, you know, you're probably right about that. And indeed, you were. Very much so. We're a couple months out from starting Fire and Blood for Valor Aritas. That'll be our weekly episodes for quite a while going forward. Uh, right before that starts will be your last chance to get in as a two dollar a month patron that price level will be going away but if you get in now you can be grandfathered in it will stay that way for as long as you keep it so you can lock in that lower price for the foreseeable future if you are so inclined that will keep you in the loop for future bonus episodes whenever they come out you'll get them sometimes a bit early you'll also potentially get access to scripts a cool nickname with some shout outs here and there, depending on what level you choose. And just, yeah, go to patreon.com slash history of Westeros. See the level that's right for you and sign up to support your favorite or one of your favorite shows. Assuming that's us. If not, well, too bad for us, <laughs> but enjoy anyway, because we still appreciate you being a listener. I got to say, by the way, not to distract too much, or maybe this is even arrogant or unprivileged, but man, I feel like $2, that's, that's too cheap. That's too good of a deal. Like, how much do you spend at a movie? A two and a half hour movie is like 15 or 20 bucks. We do two and a half hour movies four times a month. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, you've got a point there, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> With the swirl of possibilities largely rooted in the unknowns of individual personalities, Damon and Baylor being the central example there, 
But there's lots of other examples. We've run into this question many times. It's compelling and we wish we knew more, but it's also why Hollywood looks at these things and nods knowingly, seeing the potential for so much of this on the screen. They look at these relationships and these unknowns and, and without specifics, they can still look at it and see a lot of greatness or possible greatness. Two princes who are close to perfect. Those imperfections are the source of much debate and factionalizing. Damon's a bastard. Well, Baylor is Dornish. Damon looks like a perfect Targaryen. Um, Baylor looks like a Martell. Yeah, it, it, Damon might have been the better warrior, but Baylor was pretty much unbeatable, except by someone like Damon, perhaps, and there wasn't really anyone else like him. And no advantage, though, is greater than birth, which is clearly in Baylor's favor. So I know we talked about a lot of those things during the first half, but I wanted to summarize them here going into the second half. So Baylor had a lot of responsibility and pressure from an early age, as we discussed. It never let up. In fact, it probably got more so as he got older, in part because he was not only able to handle most of it, but rise above it. An unfortunate potential side effect of being good at solving problems is that you were handed a lot of problems to solve. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're good at this? Well, let's give you more problems. So it started in a hurry when his father became king in 184. Daron ascended at age 30, and Baylor was 13 when this happened. So he became crown prince uh, as a 13-year-old. His father started off with major reforms, which Baylor would have been hearing the logic of this, would have been part of the decisions, part of his council. We've seen how often the, the firstborn is just right there with the father for all these important decision-making uh, sessions or not always, but often. How often the firstborn son is right there. Yeah, you're right. Firstborn son. You're probably <laughs> right. Yeah, that, uh, that does require mm -hmm. a caveat in this setting. Uh, first off, Daron did sack the small council, getting rid of Aegon's appointments. They were all very corrupt. He chose new, new people all around. Maybe Baylor was part of that decision-making process on who to appoint. At least he may have had a little bit of a say. They would want him to be involved. He did the same with the gold cloaks, rooting out corruption there. It took a year to settle that, apparently, because... While it's easy enough to maybe fire the people at the top, it's harder to root out corruption amongst the rank and file, um, amongst the lower ranking officers. It's harder to like find that because while it can be a big problem, it's smaller scale. That's just not as obvious when you're at the top looking for the smaller problems. Baylor himself wouldn't have been on the small council at this point, as we said, but he was being groomed for it. He would eventually be handed a king. And it seems likely his father had that in mind already at this point. He's like, my son is very capable, and the best way to make sure he's going to be a good king is to make sure he's taking part in all these responsibilities that he'll have his own decisions to make on when he's, when he's older. So that seems pretty straightforward. Um, and he would have, of course, been in very influenced by his father's demeanor. Uh, and we can say that with confidence because adult Baylor did share a lot of his father's traits. But Baylor could pull it off better than his father in a lot of ways because Daron was mocked for his physique. But Baylor was physically gifted. So that's why when we at the beginning in the opening statement in the intro, we talked about how people really looked forward to Baylor being king in a lot of ways because he was not just had the personality and demeanor of a king. He looked like one. And as we've seen in Westeros, they care about that. I don't think. I don't personally think they should, but they clearly do. I mean, you get that right away in the Game of Thrones when... Jamie looks like a king to John, and and Tyrion stands as tall as a king with it when his shadow is cast. So this is this is just this is how people think of this office of king. It's you're supposed to look like a king, you know, and act like one. Well, Daron acted like one, but in, according to their, you know, ideal model, he didn't look like one. But Daylor did, except for looking Dornish, which that was a part that was a small problem, but not for everyone. <laughs> Might have looked like a king, but not a Targaryen king. There you go. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I like that. But it was still, despite these small problems, it was probably one of the most effective father-son, king, crown prince pairings we've seen. Daron may have been particularly grateful for that, given how contentious his father's relationship with him was. He's like, ah, I can work with my son in a way I was never able to work with my father because my father was Aegon the Unworthy. I mean, I've got a good son, Baylor, to work with here. And Baylor may have also seen that because he saw how terrible his grandfather was. He's like, ah, thank the seven that I have a father like this and not like my grandfather. So, I mean, because again, let's repeat just how distinctly obvious it was. Like, within some families, you kind of 
lose sight of who's right and who's wrong when you're so in it, right? But it's just so much easier to tell. Or when right? everyone's wrong. Or when everyone's wrong, yeah. <laughs> but here, it's just so much easier to tell. Now, a good example, this is why we talked back about who would have been potential idol figures or, or people to emulate in the Targaryen history. Jaehaerys worked really well with his son, Aemon, and then with Balon after Aemon died. So, of course, those both ended in tragedy. So they're too similar, because <laughs> this one will too. <laughs> but, yeah, still, those would be maybe what they were trying to uh, project. Like, we're the next Jaehaerys and Aemon, or Jaehaerys and Balon, whichever. And this point about Daron's own relationship with his father is an important one, you know, right? Aegon IV had not just hated Daron, he had specifically and publicly acted to undermine him, tried to disinherit him. This is Calling it a contentious relationship was a bit of an understatement on my part, but either way, this is the polar opposite. Someone you can work with and respect, and Baylor, like wants to learn from his father and, and takes these lessons to heart, and yeah, it must have been just night and day. Like There's other examples of kings not getting along well with their sons that we can point to. They're more like Daron and Aegon. On the opposite end, like that, like Ares not getting along with Rhaegar. That was a very contentious relationship. Egg didn't have contentious relationships with his children so much as he quarreled with them over marriages. Like, they had differences of opinion there, but that wasn't the same as, like, them trying to constantly undermine each other. But it wasn't, those weren't great relationships, at least later in life. And Makar and his sons, those, there, were some, there were some struggles there, too, although also not with one trying to overthrow the other. <laughs> so, yeah, really, Daron and Aegon was about as bad as it got. So what a refreshing, not just for them personally within the family, but for the realm. Like, ah, the king and the prince, they're working together. It's great, right? Let's take a moment to discuss the supernatural, though. I mean, given the cultural shift at court, one of the things that Daron did, apart from his reforms politically and getting rid of the small council, was he brought in septons, maesters, Part of those, some of them were Dornish, which was caused some more additional consternation about the Dornification of the court. But that's not really the point at the moment. We're more in, interested in how that affected the magical discourse. Baylor's court was very pious. Daron's is pretty pious too, but clearly he wasn't against magic. Like even Baylor, the blessed, prayed over his dragon eggs. So he, even though he was all about the, the pious, he still had that angle of syncretism where they wanted to sort of take the best of their own stuff and combine it with the faith rather than just throw away all that old stuff They're like let's still keep some of that you know <laughs> so there was a little like especially the dragons <laughs> yeah it was, so it was very utilitarian very like have it both have it your way you know <laughs> have it both ways uh, have your cake eat it too kind of logic but hey you're the king and queen and royal family you can get away with that sort of have your cake and eat it too well you can't if you're Marie Antoinette. But you can if you're the Targaryens. At least <laughs> these Targaryens. Uh, so, and again, yeah. So Daron was pro-faith. You might say, well, maybe he was against the supernatural stuff. But really, there doesn't seem to be any indication of that. In addition to the syncretism arguments, we have him very much trusting Bloodraven. Like, Bloodraven was one of his most trusted companions, in addition to being his half-brother. And Shiera was apparently just allowed to do her thing at court, and no one seemed to be bothered by that too much. Ares, his his uh, his next son, Daron's son, Baylor's younger brother, was very bookish and into this prophecy. He's the one that this rediscovers the dragons being born prophecy. So there does not seem to be much at all. In fact, there seems to be the opposite of evidence that they were against supernatural studies and magical and delving into prophecies. So, yeah. Now, Egg mentions that Ares discovers the prophecy. He says that in the Mystery Night. But he doesn't say it was just like a year ago or two years ago. So we don't know when he rediscovered the prophecy. So it might have been like 10 years before Egg makes that statement, which would have meant it came while Baylor was hand. But if it did come in the ensuing three years after the Hedge Knight, then Baylor didn't know about that. But that's a pretty big deal. I, I think it's more likely he discovered it before Baylor's death, Baylor Breakspear's death, that is, than after. But we're not sure. So at some point, Ares found a book that said the dragons would come back. We don't know when that was. It might have been before the Hedge Knight. It might have been after. But there's no indication Ares was a dreamer. There's no indication, certainly no indication Baylor was a dreamer. Baylor Breakspear. Or Daron the Good. Baylor's brother Rhaegel. Well, again, there's just he's the most unknown of this whole group. We don't know much about him. He was maybe not all mentally there. Which maybe is a sign he had dreams. 
but he yeah maybe he was all mentally there but they blew him off because he kept going on about these dreams yeah see so. he's the helena in this scenario if they're going yeah. to make a character a dreamer that wasn't made one Regal fits uh Makar, we don't know if he had dreams. We don't think he did. There's no indication he did. But but Makar's children were the ones that Eamon said, all oh, my brothers dreamed of dragons and killed them all or whatever. Mm -hmm. I forget the exact wording, but y'all have heard that quote a few times on this show and elsewhere. Not to mention Damon Blackfire's son, Damon II, did as well. So there were there was like this current generation, the ones born in the 170s, except for maybe Bloodraven, there wasn't a whole lot of evidence of direct supernatural ability or aptitude but right after them came a wave of them of potential if not actual so it was it's definitely part of Baylor's life if it, even if it's not part of his own dreams but what we'll so we'll come back to this in part two because the the only obvious dreamer the one for sure besides damon the second was daron the drunkard and he's not born until 190 or 191 right now we're around the year 185 so we're we're a few years still from that uh, none of Makar's sons have been born yet because Daron was the oldest. Now, and Bloodraven also just casually points out in the Mystery Night that, it, eh, dreamers, eh, they come up sometimes in the Targaryen family. Why not the Blackfires here and there? He just kind of casually says that, so it's pretty well known. So there's no way that Baylor didn't know about this part of his family's history. It's just like very clearly a part of their history. And if this ever hits TV or something like that, well, they would certainly draw this element out a bit because it's just a thing that would be happening. If Bloodraven had these abilities, well, he was only nine years old when Daron became king, so it may not have been clear. And, of course, with Bloodraven, was he having dragon dreams? Was he doing old gods' dreams? Was he having both? It's just, no wonder we did three episodes on him. <laughs> <laughs> and, again, Baylor the Blessed would come back to him. He prayed over his dragon eggs, but he also had visions? Were they supernatural? Or were they just the fact that he was fasting like... Like crazy, and you see things when you fast. You know, like you're gonna have, you're gonna start seeing things if you don't eat for several days. Like I, I think I explained at the time, or maybe I didn't, because we haven't actually done the Baylor of the Blessed episode yet, because it's on the shelf. I have personally experienced that, <laughs> hallucinating because of lack of food and sleep. So, yeah, I can speak to that from experience. So that doesn't mean they were dragon dreams, but it doesn't mean he didn't have them either. You know, um, it could be both. Yeah, like Baylor, for example, Baylor of the Blessed had a vision telling him to build. What became known as the Great Sept of Baylor. So, you know, that probably doesn't sound like a dragon dream, but it was, it was something. You know, it may not have been magical at all, though. It's interesting for us to speculate where the dream came from or how to name it properly, but to these characters themselves and the people they might tell, it, it's not like it, it's not like Blood Raven says, you know, I had this vision of a usurper coming and they're like wait well was that vision a dragon dream no no no, it was front of faith oh well it doesn't count i don't think that's how the conversation would go like yeah. he had a vision they're not going to care what the source of it was that's true yeah so now we don't know how long the great sept of balor took to build it was definitely not finished during balor's life and it's one of those things where like the death star it might have been used before it was fully completed like it you can for example daenerys married Maron in the year 187 a few years ahead of where we are right now at the great sept that doesn't mean the great sept was finished but it was finished enough that they could hold marriages there so yeah for example here in denver they're going to reopen casa bonita but they're not going to fully open it before they start letting guests in ah, so right on <laughs> now it's big news here in denver mm -hmm. <laughs> speaking of marriages with all these characters of similar age it makes sense they would all start to get married around the same time because these you know they're of marriageable age and the way it goes with royals is they tend to have their betrothals and marriages fairly early on especially when you're in the line of succession because alliances are part of that and this is where we get something a little odd somewhere between the age of uh, 13 and 15 which is the year 184 to 186 Baylor would have become married to jenna dondarian Highly unusual marriage, as I said, a future queen from a marcher house. Never, nothing like this had ever happened. In fact, nothing even close to this had ever happened intentionally. Now, I say intentionally because this is a really big difference. When you look at who's been queen before, there's been some unexpected names because of people dying unexpectedly. But in terms of 
we know this person's going to become king and queen one day. This was the first time in the history of the Targaryen history, history of the Targaryen history, <laughs> that it wasn't a Baratheon, Valarian, or Bar uh, Targaryen for the crown prince to marry. And it was a Dondarian, which is a far drop in prestige, right? And you got to think, well, why? Like, what's the deal here? Why did, wh what goes into that choice? Part of this we explain in the Dare on the Good episode. But to recap some of it and maybe to look at it from a little bit of a different angle is that, well, the Marcher Lords are unhappy that the wars with Dorne are over. This is part of what makes them... It's their reason to exist, to defend the realm against Dornish incursions. And it's been that way for so long. All of a sudden, their important job is gone. It doesn't need to exist except for unauthorized raids, which would still be a thing. But it's just a big drop in their prestige because they're no longer needed for this point. And that stinks, you know, for some people. They're like, we had an important job and now we don't. We've been... We're, we're no longer relevant. They don't like that. So he lifts them back up by making one of them queen. Or eventual queen. She didn't actually become queen, but would have become queen. <laughs> so That's all that counts. Yeah. And so <laughs> it also, it's also important because the marchers would have been upset that the king was going to be half Dornish. <laughs> so now they have their stake in it that's relatively equal because their children will be both, right? Uh warning pun incoming the marchers and the dornish were arch enemies the dornish would see them as march enemies though <laughs> boom <laughs> by the way i feel like once again this is another example of how times are changing yeah. you know that it, it, it's uh it's relatively new for the targaryens to be in charge in the first place and with the targaryens in charge it's new for them to not have dragons backing it up and so this is precedent setting, like not only their details of why this particular marriage was arranged at this time, but it also sets the precedent to marry other houses to get out of this rut of trying to maintain these certain houses that uh, despite that, we still have the Dance of Dragons, you know what I mean? Yeah. That didn't exactly work. Uh, uh, so let's spread it out some. We're not as worried about the dragon blood because there aren't dragons anymore. There's all these reasons to, to do this. and. It, it, not the least of which, in my opinion, is to establish a new precedent. Mm -hmm. Well said. Also well said is what Nina writes here. Wedding Baylor to Jenna also served as a signal that Daron was creating a single realm, not merely joining Dorne in the Targaryen kingdom, but forging a unified state. A child of Baylor and Jenna would be a microcosm of this piece. Dornish blood and Marcher blood, each eternally spilled at the other's expense, would now be mingled in a single person, a future king of the unified state of Westeros. Yeah. Boom. Uh, Nina also points out there is an, a little bit of an exception to the crown prince is only marrying Targaryen, Valarian, or Baratheon, and that's Magor. He married like six women and had, you know, didn't have any real children amongst that. So, yeah, <laughs> we can forget about Magor. They like to forget about Magor. We don't talk about Magor. Yes, the, the Encanto song. It's from we Encanto. Don't talk about Bruno. Oh yeah. Okay, I do know that song. We don't <laughs> yeah. talk about Magor. Yeah, that was so <laughs> we'll have to work on that. Workshop that one a little further. <laughs> so the wedding itself would have been a big deal, given the weight behind this union and what it meant for the realm. And as you say, Sean, it was a signifier of a, a change, a big change in this new Westeros that was emerging. And it's a big change because of how long the state of affairs had existed, especially because of how it, it happened. It wasn't that one side finally defeated the other in combat. It was peace. It was marriage. It was, the, you know, the good way. <laughs> so a lot of people would have been there. It probably would have been a wedding at Baylor's Sept as well. Again, if it was finished enough, because this is even a little bit before Daenerys's wedding, probably. There may have been people booing. There might have been people like not happy about it. There may have been, I don't know, some some people might have been paid to riot. You know, like maybe someone was there. Could some good stuff could be written about this? I think this is this is all very rich, even though it's just a wedding. You know, which isn't always the most exciting thing. It, this could be pretty good. There could be some pretty good stuff happening here. I think if if we get this in Fire and Blood too, I think it's got a lot of potential. I'm just reminded earlier. You know, again thinking about the idea of what kind of relationship uh, Baylor and uh, Damon would have had. I, I want them to have been like 
strong, close friends that end up pitted against each other. I think that would make for the best. Like drama. Rainier and Allison, kind of like that. Like, yes, yeah, exactly. I agree because that worked pretty well. They might not want to do that twice, but it could be different enough, you know. Um, because we've also already done that. They both hate each other thing plenty of times. Like we've seen that more in the world, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Rivals from the beginning, yeah. Like that's 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 more standard, but it's less tragic too. Yeah, if they're friends and then they have like the world makes them into enemies. Yeah, uh, I like that more too. <laughs> that's funny. I like the more tragic one more. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when we meet Baylor in the Hedge Knight, which is twenty five years from now, where the time we're talking about, he's with Lord Dondarrion. And this will continue to come up in other ways. It won't. This Dondarrion connection isn't just a, a side topic here. It's going to come back in part two. Now, before King Aegon's death, he had arranged for Daemon's bride to be Rohan of Tyrosh. Uh, but before Daemon came of age, Aegon passed. Now, Daron fulfilled that arrangement. He went ahead and honored that match. Uh, probably around the same time as Baylor's wedding to Jenna, maybe a little before. I'm guessing before, not as big a wedding because it's not the crown prince, but a pretty big deal, you know. And I, I'm guessing it was before because we know that they had kids right away. In the same year, in the year 184, the twins, Aegon and Aemon Blackfire, were born, which implies the marriage was that same year, earlier that year, because Damon wasn't even 14 until 184. So and he probably wasn't married when he was 13. He was knighted young, but he probably wasn't married young because that was up to... <laughs> that was up to Daron. He was a little more about uh, traditions here. And 14 is still pretty young. Either way, that does strongly imply that he, the Daemon was married before Baylor. And unusually, the Archon of Tyrosh was paid a dowry for his daughter to marry Daemon, where it's usually the woman's family that pays a dowry, but I think this is because Daemon was a bastard. Daemon was also given money by Daron to build a small castle on the Blackwater Rush. We're not sure where it was, but it was probably close because, again, Daron, quote-unquote, kept the great bastards close. And it's on the Blackwater Rush, which is, you know, the King, King's Landing is also on the Blackwater Rush. Uh, it's probably gone now, though, that keep, because, you know, Bloodraven tried to eradicate all signs of Damon Blackfire's existence so that people wouldn't, like, visit the red grass field and leave flowers and, you know, leave... He doesn't want them leaving homage to him, so they would... If he had a keep, they would go there. He probably raised that thing to the ground. <laughs> Especially because we haven't heard of it at any point elsewhere. Like, it's just a yeah, thing that man. apparently used to exist. Maybe it's someone else's now. But, yeah, I think I think Brendan tore that thing down. Now, of course, another important marriage here. Much is made of Daron. I mean, Damon wanting to marry his half-sister, Daenerys. The king's much younger sister. Remember, Daron and, and Daenerys were brother sister they were born very far apart i think it was 15 years apart in fact so the big gap in their age there now daron was not up for that he's like no and first of all it's a rumor that he even that damon even wanted this and it's also a rumor that he, it upset him afterwards he thought maybe he could have two wives which is also a rumor. We don't know if that's true. There's some evidence of that. It suggested that maybe Aegon was going to allow that, that take, have him take two wives. But obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and Baylor may have had a say in that. Like they may have discussed it with his father. May have said like, yeah, no, we, we, we're not going to bring back polygamy. <laughs> you know, no, let's not do that. Especially in an era of hewing closer to the faith. It's very much not <laughs> in their, <laughs> under their umbrella. Yeah, they don't like that. They don't like double marriages. They're not, they're not big on polygamy. Uh, so again, with respect to not knowing which rumors were true, either way, the bottom line was Damon married Rohan of Tyrosh, and this was very political. Uh, there's, there's suggestions that Aegon arranged this marriage originally to get the Tyrashi fleet, maybe to make more attempts at attacking Dorne. And so that's why this decision needed to be handled delicately because, well, we... Don't want to upset Dorne. Dorne was probably aware of the political machinations Aegon was making. He's, they certainly knew he tried to send a fleet against them, so he may have been looking to get a new fleet by allying with Tyrosh. So it would have been a delicate scenario, potentially. But uh, Daron wanted to honor agreements and just turn them into something more passive. He wanted to get rid of the element of violence that was lurking behind these moves and make them smoother. Smooth them out rather than breaking the deal. 
you know, and then Baylor seemed to follow his lead on all that, which is, which is a, a continuing theme. Baylor learning from his father and carrying forward a lot of those wishes it continued to seem to work together well, even at this young age. Now, it took a full two years to negotiate Maron's Martel's marriage to Daenerys, which to, uh, that two year period apparently overlapped with all these other marriages. Because while the two year negotiation was happening, that's apparently when Damon married Rohan and Baylor married Jenna. So a lot of this new kingdom is emerging. The alliances, the things keeping it held up, the people that are going to fight for it later, all being set up here. Very good, very good groundwork here. Our last section of the day is called Breakspear because it is the moment where he earns his nickname. We have to call him Baylor Breakspear to avoid confusion with the other Baylors, but he didn't earn that nickname until the year 188. Or run at 187, excuse me, when he was 17. I wonder, I wonder what they did call him up to that point. Young Breakspear or, or young Baylor, Baylor Jr. Baylor, maybe. Baylor Jr. Little Bailey. Break pair. Breaks pair. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like the damp hair. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of damp hair. Damn fair. People, because people like, including myself, read it as damn fair, you know? But no, this is Breaks pair. Yeah, I like that. It's Breaks pair. Yeah, he did not like pears. <laughs> he was a peach guy. <laughs> In the great peach versus pear wars of 189. <laughs> Many a fruit was broken. <laughs> Those stone fruits went to war. <laughs> As crown prince, he was, of course, prince of Dragonstone. But again, he probably, like his father, probably spent most of his time at court helping his father rule and learning from him and, and working side by side. So he was probably there. Actually, let me amend that. He was certainly there in the year 187 when his father led the procession with Maron Martell, marching through the streets towards the Great Sept, where they laid that golden wreath at Baylor's statue and said, your work is complete, Baylor, in front of probably a monstrous crowd, right? Because they wanted to show this off and announce the peace to as many people as possible, make a, as big a spectacle out of it as possible. And this was followed by a wedding tournament, as there so often is, wedding tournaments. So the tournament would have been giant as well, most likely. A lot of people watching. And fittingly, at the end of the tournament, Damon Blackfire met Prince Baylor Targaryen for the final tilt. Now, we're not sure what built up to this. This is another thing I'm looking forward to seeing exactly how this came about. Sean, with our discussion on tournaments before, there could have been some arranging to make sure the two luminaries met in the finals, like a little sh arranging of the matches to make sure they didn't meet prior to that, to make sure it was at the end. But it's also possible that it was one of those ones where you get to challenge who you want, and they did it. Like, they, they made it a spectacle on purpose. Who knows who arranged it, but it's an awfully convenient that they fought right at the final tilt. So, yeah. Uh. <laughs> We have in our minds this idea of like brackets, you know, like tournaments are a pretty kind of standard thing in modern society. But in in the real world, tournaments of this sort weren't always run the same way. They didn't always have neat brackets. And in Martin's world, clearly we've seen different formats for it, like the uh, the, the specific one in, in the Hedge Knight was not a standard bracket tournament at all. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they had the tapping of the shield. You get to challenge who you want. They had the five champions and you could pick who you wanted, which of them you and wanted you to went, challenge. Through, yeah, rounds of anyone in a crowd challenging one of these five and rotating out and like a completely different from any other formats. So. And by the way, when Harding was injured because of Arian cheating and spewing his horse, they decided on suggestion that they should only have four champions and that the fifth champion, he should be able to retire as a champion and no one should be able to challenge him because he broke his leg. Whose suggestion was that? Baylor Breakspear, the chivalrous, the honorable, the yeah. thinking of trying to think of everyone and trying to make sure no one's feelings are rankled and trying to keep the drama from developing. Someone who sees the drama develop ahead of time and shuts it down. Someone who has a lot of experience with that because he saw so much of it as a child. <laughs> <laughs> like so much court yeah. drama. He's like, no, I'm good at seeing this coming and I have the authority to shut it down <laughs> and people will listen to me. And he's like, his, his suggestion, Lord Ashford's like, you're right, Prince Baylor, let's do that. You know? 
you know, it's a reasonable suggestion too. It is. You know what yeah. I mean? There's a lot of other things you could have suggested that people might have been like, well, what about this? And how about if? And well, that's not fair because, but this one's like, uh, yeah, good idea. Like then no one, there's not really any argument. Yeah. So. And he had to rule against his own, you know, nephew, Arian, to, to make that ruling too. So, you know, he showed that he wasn't biased against his own family there. So that was, that looked really good, you know? And you're like, yeah, he's, justice is justice, right? But back to this tournament. This is before Baylor was known as a deliverer of justice. He's just a, you know, still a young, up-and-coming prince at this point. We can only imagine the setting here, the stage, the excitement as they tilted repeatedly back and forth. And we know they did back and forth because that's exactly why he got the name Breakspear because it took a lot of tilts. He kept breaking lances, splintering them. Eventually, Baylor emerged the victor, knocked Damon off his horse. It must have been such a moment, like a like the overtime in the finals of some sporting match, mm-hmm. overtime in the Super Bowl, extra innings in the World Series, fifth quarter in NBA or the fourth period in NHL overtime. I forget how that works. Really exciting. The equivalent of sudden death, except without, you know, death being just as not literal in this setting for once as, as it is in the real world sports. Potential was there. Well, but. Yeah, right. The potential was there. One of them could have had an could have had an accident, and it would have been really exciting. The roar, the crowd, minus the disappointment of some of them who really wanted Damon to win, because they would have been there would have been some like rooting against the Dornish guy, or rooting for the Valyrian guy, or rooting for the, yeah, just they had their favorites for whatever reason, and it's more than just their favorites. It also represented like who they thought was more worthy, which faction they thought was better. A lot of the same vibes in episode one of House of the Dragon season one with that tournament sort of showcasing off some of the same things here. So that was a lot bloodier <laughs> and a lot yeah. less uh, honorable. Like this was chivalrous. Like Baylor and Damon were chivalrous guys. There wasn't going to be someone spearing the other guy's horse, right? So as many similarities as there may have been, there were also some big differences. And this is an era where that mattered more. The dance era was where those things had kind of fallen off, where a lot of those values had been forgotten. This was an era that was more accustomed to the horrors of war and had started to back off. It's like, all right, let's not be so eager to get into a war again. That said, they would be getting into war again pretty soon. <laughs> Only a few years later. So by this point, Baylor was probably already a tournament winner. He may, maybe had already won a couple, but maybe not. Maybe this was his first big win. I mean, he was only 17 years old. And it was fantastic timing. I mean, what a tournament to win in front of everybody with this reputation. His success as a jouster would continue to rise. The whole realm saw it after such an epic battle. I mean, no wonder both his nickname and the memories stuck with people for so long. Maybe Damon took his loss graciously. Maybe Agor was there to whisper in his ear and say, this should be you getting all the cheers. Maybe 13-year-old Brendan Rivers saw this whispering, saw this division, and started to understand where things were going. Were people already wary? Were people people already seeing where this was headed? Some few may have. But mostly, I would guess they didn't. They didn't see what was coming in about nine years. After Baylor won that tournament, he probably did what most champions do. He greeted the crowd. He celebrated. He accepted their acclaim. He was probably very gracious. I mean, everything about him suggests that he would have been, you know, not a braggart or anything like that. He would have bowed or whatever he needs to do, like shown homage to the gods. And his father congratulated the, the, the marriage, the bride and groom and all that, honored why they were there. I imagine he helped Damon to his feet. Sure, sure, yeah. Right? And, you know, Break held his hand up and, and all that. Yeah, all the, all the yeah. things a gracious winner does, I, I predict that. But he would have taken his helmet off of two during this, and people would see and be reminded of what he looked like. Mm-hmm. And here's, interestingly, you may have noticed, folks, that this episode has not had any quotes yet, but we're leaving you with one here, one that sticks out for its application here. Yet too many men looked upon Baylor's dark hair and eyes and muttered that he was more Martell than Targaryen, even though he proved a man who could win respect with ease and was as open-handed and just as his father. Knights and lords of the Dornish marches came to mistrust Aaron, and Baylor as well, 
and began to look more and more to the old days, when Dornishmen were the enemy to fight, not rivals for the king's attention or largesse. And then they would look at Damon Blackfire, grown tall and powerful, half a god among mortal men, and with the conqueror's sword in his possession, and wonder. Now, among those cheering loudly for Baylor would certainly be whatever Dornish were in attendance. They would certainly approve of his victory over Damon. And, of course, looking Dornish would have just helped fuel their applause and their acclaim for him, at least in part. And the cheers of those Dornish might further inflame those who were upset by this state of affairs. Those same people who looked at Damon Blackfire, grown tall and powerful, half a god among mortal men, and indeed wonder... Yeah, many would be uh, doing both. Some of these would be marcher lords. Some of these would be just fans of Damon Blackfire who thought he was better, the better man, like the Sir Eustaces of the world. As we've said before, one of the purposes of tourneys, and some of this wisdom is forgotten at times, is to prepare for battles, for real wars. That this competition ended with the two greatest young knights of the era, both perhaps eager to be the next Dragon Knight, was apt because their entertaining spectacle would turn out to be just that, a prelude to real war. Next week, Baylor Part 2, we will begin in the year 188, cover the prelude to the Blackfire Rebellions, the Blackfire Rebellion, well, just the one. He only lived through one. And his time as Hand of the King that followed, which was a 13-year reign right up until his death in the Hedge Knight. Lots more interesting things to come. He's going to have children. He's going to have war. He's going to have more disputes. Lots of other things we'll come up with for you. Can't wait. And whatever else y'all think, because this one was recorded uh, in the studio without live viewers, but part two will be live, so y'all will have a chance to do live feedback and send in any other questions you may have. Feel free to do so. Your question may get answered live on the show. Let's have our trivia answer. The question again was, Baylor the Blessed, a.k.a. Baylor the Befuddled, uh, alongside the name Baylor Breakspear reminds us that George likes alliteration in his nicknames. And my question was, in A Song of Ice and Fire, there's a character named Baylor, and he has two nicknames as well, one mocking, one complimentary. What are those names? Baylor Hightower is the answer. His nickname is Baylor Bright Smile, but if you ask Oberyn Martell and the deceased Elia Martell, no, I guess Oberyn is also deceased. <laughs> <laughs> they called him Baylor Breakwind because he he <laughs> farted in front of Elia when she was presented to him as a possible suitor. So that didn't work out so well. She couldn't take him seriously after he <laughs> farted. <laughs> so Baylor Breakwind he was. What a miss. Yeah, what a miss. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned a lot of our episodes in this one. Aim in the Dragon Knight, part one and two, of course. The Blackfire Rebellions, obviously. The Summer Hall episode got a brief mention. And The Trouble with Tourneys, a very fairly recent episode from the end of 2022 that discusses some of the things we discussed here in terms of how tournaments are set up for bigger things and, and an opportunity for chicanery and tricks and intrigue and all sorts of symbolic developments and all sorts, just all sorts of things. We spent a whole episode on it, so if you didn't check that one out, maybe you should. Thanks to those of you who support us on Patreon or Spotify or who send us donations through our website. Those are all ways you can support us financially if you wish to contribute. You can follow the links to do that yourself. We would much appreciate it. Thanks to Nina for her great notes on this episode and for nearly all our episodes. She had some great insight that we were able to discuss and add to and fill out what we had already said. So, yeah. Again, another win for her and for us for having her in our corner. Thanks to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for the music assistance and video intro on Bran's part. What a great contribution that has been for us over the years. And to Michael Klarfeld for that, plus his excellent maps that you see behind us in every single episode. And thanks to our Benjineer for sound quality assistance, making sure we sound as good as we can. Recording is tricky, and it's good to have someone who really knows what they're doing helping us out with the things that go wrong and making it all go smoothly when it doesn't, or when it does. Either way, smooth sound is what we try to deliver. Until next time, my friends, fellow historians and listeners and watchiners, whatever your preferred term is, we appreciate your presence, we appreciate your listenage, 
And until next time, Valar re-release.